work with our policymakers and our congressmen uh, and women um, to make uh, smart decisions about the security and the policies of our country. Um, there's also uh, the um, one detail is uh, about statistics is the number of MIAs when we left Iraq. I think there were eight in, by May of 2011, and seven out of those eight were private contractors. Now, some of them would not be from the United States because they would have been uh, subcontracted, or they, uh, you have to look at the breakdown of different countries that we hire um, um, private security out of. But the um, um, but seven out of the eight, so one was traditional military, and uh, that is um, another detail. <clears throat> but in the um, in the flow of the book. What I'm hoping is that you will become as interested as I am in all levels of this industry. The financial level, the expansion, the history, the origins, uh, the need for better, more monitoring, uh, the many markets, many services, um, and um, the major, uh, and some of the issues, like I said, of the contractors themselves. You know, and some of these statistics, as I've said, are um, impossible to, uh, you, you can't really embrace the entire industry and say what the um, revenue numbers are or how big it is, how many people it employs. And so that, um, <clears throat> there are individuals and there are groups working on that at the moment also. But, um, but at any rate, um, the, uh, I wanted to read you a couple of quotes from very uh, bright people I interviewed, um, and then we'll move on to questions. <clears throat> I'd like to read from the book, but the um, I had an editor years ago who said, never fall in love with your own writing. So when I'm on the road, I never <laughs> feel that I shouldn't be reading all the details, uh, all the paragraphs in my book. I should be reading from some of the sources. And he never said, don't fall in love with the quotes of your sources. So, um, so um, there are several here. Um, one of them is from uh, the, um, uh, if you wait for one second, the, uh, uh, actually let's do a, a quote at the very beginning from um, uh, David Eisenberg, who's sitting right here, if it doesn't embarrass him, he, did the, he said this before a congressional hearing, and, um, and it sort of livens up, uh, helps to uh, give you a sense of how intense the reliance is. This was uh, uh, his uh, statement about the U.S. government's dependence on private contractors for defense and security. He said, think back to the Alien series, the films about the indescribable alien creature that has entered the bodies of humans. The humans look normal on the outside, but inside the alien has wrapped itself around every organ and has become so entwined that it cannot be excised. The human would die without it. And here, the private military and security companies are so entwined, the government would collapse without them. Then we go to Chris Shays who was the former co-chairman of the Wartime Contracting Commission just in the spring of 2014. He made the comment, um, the one thing that's a given, we can't go to war without contracts and we can't go to peace without, we can't go to war without contractors and we can't go to peace without contractors. Um, <clears throat> And a former um, British Army officer who's been very active within the industry was a director of a company, um, exceptionally bright uh, and generous individual, very deeply involved in the industry for a long time. One of his uh, quotes um, was that the private military and security companies will evolve into multinational and multi excuse me, functional firms, so that governments and corporations will go to them as single servers and get used to relying on them. Then they'll succeed more and more, and what seems hidden now will simply be integrated so that future generations won't know the difference. 
traditional militaries will become smaller and smaller and the industry will continue to grow. And um, the one from a, uh, a general who, um, at the Command and General Staff College, who has been <coughs> very uh, knowledgeable on the topic and has been reading about it for a long, really informing himself and was right involved in uh, some of the action in Iraq, um, said, the nation state with its slow ability to act militarily due to political realities is becoming increasingly vulnerable to easy solutions that avoid the complexity of government. That is a reality and nothing shows that more than the growth of the private military and security businesses. Gradually, systems of international security that have been in place for a long time are beginning to fall apart and the more anarchy worldwide, then the more these companies offer themselves as the solution. And I think that the, a really good quote to follow that up with is the, um, follow, follow that one, is a sort of less known quote by Eisenhower. Um, you know, we all know in the councils of government we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence whether sought or unsought by the military industrial complex. That was, that's the famous uh, uh, comment uh, by Eisenhower in his farewell address in January 1961. And I have to tell you, if I had more time, I'd go into details about being out in Abilene last week at the Eisenhower Library. Very fascinating to see their response to uh, studying the um, evolution of some of what he said. Um, but one of the comments that, that you never really read about it was the part of his warning in 1961, crises there will continue to be. In meeting them, whether foreign or domestic, great or small, there is a recurring temptation here to feel that some spectacular and costly action could become the miraculous solution to all current difficulties. So, um, uh, so I think that, um, um, how many more minutes do I have? <laughs> okay, so I think that, um, oh, there's so many colorful people in this book and so many colorful comments. I think I actually will um, uh, put aside my humility and uh, read a couple paragraphs. I'll read you the first two paragraphs and um, and then the beginning of um, a, um, a chapter that is about, um, I was thinking maybe Doug Brooks would come tonight, uh, that is introduces you to the trade association for uh, private military and security companies in the, Uni in the United States. So first, uh, so I'll do one in tribute to Doug Brooks as soon as I read you the very beginning. This is the prologue. The book uh, starts with a prologue uh, to introduce the general reader to the topic through a story. And, um, and then it's in three parts. Uh, transformation, which is the beginning evolution of the industry and the, as I said, corporate evolution of the mercenary trade, into uh, reaction, part two. And part three is expansion, so you get a sense of all of the markets and the vast services provided by uh, these companies. <clears throat> In reaction, of course, includes Congress, takes you to Congress, the military, and to uh, Geneva. So <clears throat> this is the beginning. What the, boy, what the boy would remember most were the shoes. They were not his shoes, and they didn't fit. Yet he was forced to wear them for nearly five hours as he crossed a desert in the middle of the night. At first glance, they seemed like ordinary leather shoes, but they were different because the heels were at the front. Shoes with backward heels and soles were the invention of the human smugglers who helped people like the boy and his parents to escape from Iraq into Kuwait. The idea was that if footprints were detected, the path of the journey would appear to be reversed. Although the boy longed to go home that night, what stopped him was his astute understanding that if he did, then his backward footprints would define a trail leading to the Kuwait border and thus expose his family's flight. 
Kadim Desmal Mayad Afanani was 14 years old when he was forced to leave Iraq in April 1985. His mother awakened him shortly after midnight to tell him that he would soon be going on a desert adventure. For the third time in a year, Kadim felt the anxiety of sudden change coursing through him like a forced injection. The first time had been 11 months before, when in the middle of the night he heard a rush of rapid pounding on the roof above his bed. In his half-asleep state, he had a dreamlike image that it was Gazam, his brother, coming home. Gazam, who had fled to Syria months before to avoid fighting for Saddam Hussein in the Iraqi war against Iran. But he knew it was not Gazam when he began to hear the loud cracking sounds of splintering wood, followed by his mother screaming. Soldiers in Saddam's security forces had smashed through the front door of his family's home in Basra, and as, as his mother watched, they dragged away his father, who was suspected of betraying Saddam, and was wanted for information about Gazem. The second shock came in the days and months that followed his father's disappearance.